Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. This is my 61st lesson from my series called A Journey to Faith. Tonight's lesson is called Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim, the Puppet Kings of Judah. We will first look at the period of rule of Jehoahaz, the son of God's incredible servant, King Josiah, who despite being the youngest of four brothers, is elected by the people of Judah to ascend the throne. King Jehoahaz only ruled for three short months before being dragged off to Egypt by Pharaoh Necker II, who made his brother Jehoiakim king. With the death of their father, King Josiah, the kingdom of Judah lost its independence once again and this time became a vassal or subject state of a reviving Egyptian kingdom. In this lesson, there will be a large focus on the prophet Jeremiah, who God uses constantly in this point of history to speak to the king and the people of Judah. His warnings are dire as the threat of the soon-to-arrive Babylonian forces from the north becomes stronger and stronger. To learn about this extraordinary story and to understand the historical and pivotal portion of the Bible from which God has a message for each of us, join me now for this interactive teaching. A Journey to Faith is a series based on the genealogy of Jesus, which you can find in Matthew uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. From Abraham to Jesse, the father of David, we followed each of the descendants in the genealogy of Jesus. And now from the time of King David right through to the very last kings, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim are amongst the last before the Babylonian exile. So sit back and relax. Don't forget to press that share button. Uh, let's share the word of the Lord to as many people as possible. And if you do want to watch the video again, you can watch it on our YouTube channel or on our website at thejesusmovement.com.au. Let's begin. Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. In this lesson, we're having a look at the two sons of King Josiah, who was unfortunately killed by a stray arrow when he went to stop King Necho II, the Pharaoh of Egypt, from passing through his land to join the Assyrians. When this happened, his son Jehoahaz is the son that is the fourth of his children and he becomes the 16th king of Judah. He was originally named Shalom, which you can find in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 15. And at birth, he was born by his mother Hamatul, the daughter of Jeremiah from Libna. Although he is the youngest of four brothers, Shalom is elected by the people of Judah to ascend the throne at the age of 23 when his father was killed. So before we go any further, we're just going to go to the first screen for tonight. And on this screen, it just gives us a bit of a good picture of the last of the rulers of the kingdom of Judah. And you can see here last week we were looking at King Josiah, who we've mentioned was killed. And then the next to rule is Joahaz or Joahaz. Now he was uh, only going to rule for a three month period, as I said, he was elected by the people. He gets taken to Egypt as a prisoner, as we'll explain in a moment, and he's replaced by his brother, whose name is Eliakim, and his name is changed to Jehoiakim, and then he goes on to become the next ruler, of whom we're going to look at about half of his story uh, in this lesson tonight. Following Jehoiakim's reign, uh, we have Jehoiakim, who then only rules for a three month period as well, and he's actually taken away by the Babylonians. He's then replaced by his uncle, Matania, whose name is changed to Zedekiah, who will rule for 11 years until he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. And then at, the, at this point in time, uh, we have some uh, uh, horrible uh, things that happen to him because he's forced to watch the execution of his sons, then he has his eyes put out and taken captive to Babylon. He's then replaced uh, by a governor called Gedaliah, who eventually was killed and the remaining of people of Judah fled to Egypt. So that gives you a bit of an overview 
of this last period of time of the kings uh, before Babylonian exile. So rename Jehoahaz, as we mentioned, on his coronation, he will only rule for three months, and those months are between Tammuz and Tishrei. In our calendar, that means from June to July through to September, October, because their months overlap by two weeks on each of ours, in the year 609 BC. Now, he's not actually listed by name in the genealogy of Jesus, as we're following, but he is mentioned as one of Jehoiakim's brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. You can find that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Now, we're going to spend a fair bit of time with the prophet Jeremiah in tonight's lesson. He was very prevalent at this point in time. Um, and we're going to open with Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 11 to 17. So if you'd like to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 11 to 17. The opening for this scripture reads, For this is what the Lord says about Shalom, son of Josiah, who succeeded his father as king of Judah, but has gone from this place. He will never return. He will die in the place where they have led him captive. He will not see this land again. And it goes on to read, Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness. I'll just come over to this side of the screen. His upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labour. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. So he makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar and decorates it in red. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, so all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and needy, and so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? But your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood, and on oppression and extortion. And so Jeremiah paints an opening picture of the character of Jehoahaz. It's quite extraordinary that he comes into power and the first thing he's interested in doing is making more spacious upper rooms in the palace with more windows. And so we find through that that he uses forced labour and he doesn't actually pay them any money. And so the Lord's saying, does this make you any more of a king? And so the challenge is put out there that Jehoah has is not walking well with the Lord and he's only interested in his own means. Now the prophet Jeremiah spoke the word of the Lord, a word that said that Shalom, or Jehoahaz as it becomes known, would be taken captive to another land. It seems incomprehensible that Jehoahaz would disregard the reforms his father had made to commit, as it says in 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 32, evil in the eyes of the Lord. But the prophet's words make it clear that upon his coronation, Jehoahaz immediately began to build himself a great palace by dishonest gain, shed innocent blood, and used oppression and extortion to achieve his desire. God knew Jehoahaz would lead the people of Jerusalem and Judah to worship other gods and to abandon him. And so we find this extraordinary story unfolding as we look at this each lesson recently, we have this sin cycle which represents the Bible. Now we found that in the previous lesson that Josiah overturned his evil father Manasseh's religious uh, reforms to the country and put the worship of the Lord back into place. And so as a consequence, the punishment that had been exacted on his father was reversed and the Lord rescued him and restored him back into relationship. And during his journey, we learn about everything that happens uh, in terms of religious reforms. But once again, generation by generation, we find that they're not all the same. And so an evil father, Manasseh, gave birth to a child, Josiah, who was a good king. And he's the last of the good kings in the Old Testament. 
And then the son of Josiah turns this all around again and goes back to sin once again. And so as a consequence of this, we know that the Lord is going to bring in a punishment and the prophet Jeremiah is there to make it clear exactly what will happen if they don't change their ways. Now Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt defeated the army of Judah and killed King Josiah. The desire to block Egypt's passage to join King Asher Ubalit II of Assyria cost them three months delay and during this time Jehoahaz, it says in 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 31, reigned in Jerusalem three months. An opportunity presented itself to conquer this kingdom for himself. So following the defeat of Judah's army, the Pharaoh went south to Jerusalem and deposed the new king. Now it says in 2 Kings chapter 23 verses 33 to 34, Pharaoh and Necho put him in chains at Riblah, in the land of Hamath, so that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on Judah a levy of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. Pharaoh and Necho made Eliakim, son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah, and changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. So the Bible tells us that Jehoaz was taken from Jerusalem to Riblah in Hamath to a staging post where the Egyptian army was assembled on the way to meet the Assyrian king and his army. Overwhelmed by the Egyptian ruler, Jehoahaz was put in chains and imprisoned while his older brother Eliakim was placed on the throne late in October 609 BC with his name changed to Jehoiakim. So to bring some light to all of this information, I have a map that I've produced here for you in order that you can better understand what's happening. And so we'll start over here with basically what was happening last week during the story of King Josiah. We had the Persians come up from Anshan down here, which is in today's Iran, and they crossed over the Zagros Mountains and they went all the way up here to Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They were joined by the Medes, who left from their capital in Ekbatana, and they too went to Nineveh. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, the Babylonians, they followed up the rivers, and they went to Nineveh as well. And all of them joined together with the Sumerians and the Scythians, who come from these regions up here, and they attacked the Assyrian capital, as it says, in 612 BC. Now they consequently won that battle, and that was the end of that particular Assyrian ruler, the second last ruler of the Assyrian Empire. When uh, this battle was completed, the general of the army and the remnant of the army went off to the west here, over to Haran. Excuse me. <coughs> In Haran, they made this their capital, as it says, in 610 BC. Now, whilst this was happening, the Egyptians down here, they had been made a puppet kingdom of the Assyrians. And so the ruler of the Egyptians at the time, Necho II, was sympathetic to the cause of the Assyrians. He was actually worried about all these new nations who had come together against the Assyrians because he understood that if they kept coming, they would eventually make their way down into the kingdom of Egypt. And so when he came up, in the scriptures it tells us that he didn't wish to actually fight against the king of Judah, who was Josiah at the time, but he simply wanted to pass through the land. He actually said that the Lord had told him that this was what he was to do. But Josiah wouldn't listen. He didn't trust him. And so he attacked him. And the consequence was that Josiah was shot and died from an arrow. So this caused Pharaoh Necho II to be three months late. And so he basically missed this battle. 
So he decides that because the kingdom of Judah no longer has a ruler, he's just killed him, that he will go back down to Jerusalem and do something about it. And so he goes down and he takes Jehoahaz prisoner in chains and he installs his brother Eliakim onto the throne. He subsequently takes Jehoahaz up to Hamath, which is this place which is this, the, uh, where they're going to organize their army uh, in preparation for heading up to the final battle here in Karshemesh. Obviously Eliakim is the brother of Jehoahaz, so we don't see the brothers sticking together here, so it doesn't say much for their brotherhood. But he would understand by watching his brother being taken away in chains that if he didn't do what the Pharaoh said, that this would be the consequence for him too. And so he obeyed him. Then we find that the Pharaoh went up and he had joined the Assyrians in battle uh, at Karshemesh. And this happened in 609 BC, the year that we're actually in. And we'll go through this, but basically they lose this battle. It's the end of the Assyrian Empire. And the Pharaoh returns with Jehoahaz back to Egypt whilst maintaining Eliakim as a vassal kingdom who have to pay taxes to the Egyptians. And so we can see that the kingdom of Judah, even at this point in time, is no longer an independent nation. So I hope that map helps to give you understanding through this historical portion of the Bible. Now in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 35, it says, Jehoiakim paid Pharaoh Necho the silver and gold he demanded. In order to do so, he taxed the land and exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land according to their assessments. The kingdom of Judah was forced to pay a tribute of 3,000 kilograms of silver and 30 kilograms of gold. Additionally, it had its next ruler appointed by an Egyptian pharaoh. So as I've just mentioned, the defeat of King Josiah at Megiddo represented the end of Judah's independence. They had been turned into a vassal and collapsed under the foot of a reviving Egypt. God's promise of the demise of the kingdom of Judah after King Josiah's death had begun. So for the first time since the people of Israel asked God to be ruled by a king of their own, they have come full circle. Under the direction of Moses, the Israelites were freed from the slavery of Egypt. Here, after the rule of generations of their own kings, they find themselves back in the same situation, although still with their own king, he is but a puppet under the yoke of Egyptian rule. Now, Pharaoh Necho II proceeded with his original campaign, as I mentioned when I was showing the map, and he joined the Assyrian king, Asher Ubalit II, who was a former army general after the last emperor had died in the battle at Nineveh. Crossing the Euphrates River together, their forces lay siege to Haran, but they failed, and the monumental consequence of this led to the collapse of the Assyrian Empire. Again, we've just shown this on the map. The Assyrian king Asher Ubal II disappears from the historical record at this point, and it's not known whether he was killed or not. The Egyptian army retreated to northern Syria and set up a garrison at Karshemesh, whilst Pharaoh Necho II marched through the northern Syrian territories they occupied to take Jehoahaz from Riblah in Hamath back with him to Egypt as his prisoner. And you can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 34. Jehoahaz ended his days there. He was the first Judean king to die in exile, never to return. Jehoahaz was the first king of Judah not to be buried in the city of David in Jerusalem. The prophet Jeremiah told the people of Judah in Jeremiah chapter 22 verse 10, Weep bitterly for him who is exiled, because he will never return nor see his native land again. And so even though he was an evil king, he was one of the sons of Abraham. He was one of God's children. And so there was a outpouring of grief that such a thing could happen and also that the, that the condition or the state of the kingdom of Judah had come to such a poor condition at this point in time in history. So we're going to uh, just step back to a prophetic word 
this brings us to the end of the story of Jehoahaz. It's short um, because he only rules for three months. But this, the bigger picture story, which I've explained on the map behind us, behind me, shows you that there's a lot going on at this period in time. There's a collapse of one empire and the emergence of another empire. So we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. I'll just mention before we do that this is the uh, last of the Assyrian king here, 612 to 609 BC. Uh, the Assyrian Empire, as we're talking about, ends in this very year. His name is Asher Ubalit II. We can see here, we spoke about him last week, King Nebuchadnezzar. He took over as the Babylonian king. His son is Nebuchadnezzar, who we're going to uh, speak a lot of uh, his life story from the Bible. And he was actually the crown prince and he was the head of the army. So he was the one who was chasing across uh, towards the west, chasing down the Assyrian uh, army as they fled. Now you can note here as well that Nabopolassar, he actually died in 611 BC, but Nebuchadnezzar only began to rule as the king in 604 BC. So you can see there's a gap of years there. The reason for that is not because there was no one to rule the country. He was the crown prince. The thing was he was at war. He was on the road in, in battle. So there was no coronation, no crowning of him as the king. And so we have a period of time where there is no formal king, but we have a crown prince who's leading his army who represents his nation. Of course, when we get to 604 BC, he will be coronated and he will become the second king of the Babylonians. Now you can see by the colors over here that Josiah, the previous king, he was alive during the reign of several different Assyrian leaders and the, and the beginning of the first of the Babylonian leaders. Whereas uh, King Jehoahaz, he doesn't actually have a place on here. He's not part of the genealogy of Jesus and he only rules for three months. So he shares this common line that passes from uh, Josiah before he gets to Jehoiakim across to the last Assyrian emperor and across to this uh, time in between the two when they're being chased to the west. So now we're going to move on to Jehoiakim, who the Egyptians have placed as a puppet ruler for the kingdom of Judah. And so let's go to the prophetic word of Jeremiah. And in this particular prophetic word, Jeremiah is lamenting the coming destruction. The Lord has told him what's going to happen but obviously they're very sad because this is their people and their nation. And of course the temple of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, which is the Lord's house. And so it reads, Gather up your belongings to leave the land, you who live under siege. For this is what the Lord says. At this time I will hurl out those who live in this land. I will bring distress on them so that they may be captured. Woe to me because of my injury, my wound is incurable. Yet I said to myself, this is my sickness and I must endure it. So we're talking about the Lord here because he's revealing the word of the Lord. My tent is destroyed, all its ropes are snapped. My children are gone from me and are no more. No one is left now to pitch my tent or to set up my shelter. The shepherds are senseless and do not inquire of the Lord, so they do not prosper and all their flock is scattered. Listen, the report is coming. A great commotion from the land of the north. It will make the towns of Judah desolate, a haunt of jackals. And so we see a picture being painted here by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, which is very, very bleak. Now these words were directed to the people of Judah who had once again drifted away from the God of Israel. And of course, the Lord loves them very much. He says that his tent is destroyed. And so his tent is a description which talks about the house of Israel and everything that comes within it. The temple, his city, his mountain, his people, he says that his tent is destroyed. In other words, his earthly kingdom is destroyed. And first it was the house of Israel, which we can speak about to the north, the northern kingdom of Israel. 
They were taken out by these very Assyrians and now it's to be the house of Judah who's going to be taken out by the Babylonians. It goes on to say its ropes are snapped. And so what this means is that the relationship with God was severed. When the ropes are snapped, it's what held the tent together. It's the relationship with God which they had abandoned. So no matter how many times God's people were warned about doing evil, no matter how many times they worshipped other gods, and no matter how many times they were punished, God's warnings always seemed to fall on deaf ears. The dreaded hour of judgment was about to descend upon them. The enemy in Jeremiah's visions drew near, as it says, from the land of the north. The towns of Judah were about to be made desolate and become the haunt of jackals. And so we're going to go now specifically to the story of Jehoiakim, the 17th king of Judah, born Eliakim, the second son of King Josiah. He has a different mother. Her name is Zebedah, daughter of Padiah of Rumah. When his father died, Eliakim's younger brother Jehoahaz did not ascend the throne by right of birth, but in fact, he was elected by the people. He didn't last long though, for he was deposed by Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt after the short period of time of three months. The Pharaoh appoints Eliakim to rule Judah and changes his name, as we've mentioned, to Jehoiakim at the age of 25 to rule as a vassal of Egypt. Jehoiakim will reign for 11 years from 609 BC until he is killed in 598 BC. And his death is not a good one, for the Bible tells us that he has his body thrown out of Jerusalem's gates. Jehoiakim is not listed by name in the genealogy of Jesus either, but like his brother Jehoahaz, he is mentioned as one of Jehoiakim's brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. And again, we find that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. So both Jehoahaz or Shalom or Jehoiakim, formerly called Eliakim, are both brothers to one another and sons of King Josiah. And so we're going to go now to another word of the Lord given by the prophet Jeremiah concerning Jehoiakim. And it reads, Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my brother. Alas, my sister. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my master. Alas, his splendor. He will have the burial of a donkey, dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. Go up to Lebanon and cry out. Let your voice be heard in Bashan. Cry out from Abram, for all your allies are crushed. I warned you when you felt secure, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth. You have not obeyed me. The wind will drive all your shepherds away and your allies will go into exile. Then you will be ashamed and disgraced because of all your wickedness. You who live in Lebanon, who are nestled in cedar buildings, how you will groan when pangs come upon you, pain like that of a woman in labor. And so once again, we see this very dire prophecy being given by Jeremiah as the word of the Lord to his people of that time. So Jeremiah systematically rolls out one prophecy after another, and they're directed at very specific people, namely the different rulers as each of them take over. So the prophet Jeremiah here, where he spoke the word of the Lord, painted a picture of contempt for Jehoiakim. This picture was so bad that upon Jehoiakim's death, Jeremiah prophesies he will have the burial of a donkey and be dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem, which means that no one will even mourn for him. Earlier, the Lord had said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 verse 14, From the north disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. Here, 
those from the north are described Lebanon on the coast, Bashan to the east of the Sea of Galilee, and Abram encompassing the Nebo Ranges to the northeast. And so I have a map here for you to help you to see what that looks like. So this is Lebanon, just off the top of the map here. So the uh, Dan, Mount Hermon, this is the northern border of Israel. And so Lebanon's the next uh, country above today. And so from the north here, coming down the coast, we find that the Babylonians are going to come down through this territory here and those who live there are going to be taken away into exile. They will also come down this highway which is known as the King's Highway which heads up to northern Mesopotamia and those in the region of Bashan will also be taken away into exile and we find that the Babylonians will enter from that point as well. The third place mentioned is Abraham, so here's Mount Nebo where Moses went up to the mountain uh, to be buried and he was resurrected. And so Abraham represents this region here which comes off the King's Highway, it's another junction that then comes across to Jericho, uh, not far from Jerusalem here. And so it says in this region too that all of these people will be taken away into exile and the armies will come across from here. So we can see they're coming down from three different directions. When you come through Bashan, you can come over here at Bayat Shean, the house of rest, and up through the hill country down to Jerusalem this way. You can come down the King's Highway and across the Fords of Jericho to Jerusalem this way. And of course, you can come down the coast road and work your way across to Jerusalem this way as well. So Jerusalem was well and truly being surrounded. So having listened to foreign allies, and worship their foreign gods the Lord said he will crush them and also drive away Judah's shepherds so there he's talking about the king of course he's the ultimate shepherd of the flock but we're also talking about other leaders as well perhaps tribal leaders the officials for the temple and the court and etc and he says that he will drive them away like objects in the wind to end up in exile under Babylonian rule it goes on to say, you who live in Babylon, nestled in cedar buildings. And so here we're talking about the king's palace built by King Solomon. And it's actually named, if you're not sure or you haven't heard this, it is in the Bible. And it's actually named the Palace of the Forest of Lebanon. And so when King Hiram of Tyre took the cedar logs from Lebanon and floated them down the coast to uh, Jaffa and across to Jerusalem, both the temple and the palace, they use these, these very grand and large cedar logs to build the, the, uh, the palace and the temple. And it goes on to say that, that you who live in Lebanon nestled in cedar buildings, though we're talking about the king and his court, will groan and suffer in pain like a woman giving birth to a child. And so, of course, giving birth to a child, not only is there the pain associated with giving birth, but there's an outcome where the child will actually be born and taken out of the womb of the mother. And so the people will be taken out of God's womb, if you will, into exile. So early in the reign of Jehoiakim, the prophet Jeremiah received this word from the Lord in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 1. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be reading several scriptures now from Jeremiah chapter 7. So the first one again, Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 1. And it says, Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. The God of Israel was merciful because he loved his people and he told Jeremiah to tell them, to reform their ways and he would still let them live in Jerusalem and Judah. In Jeremiah chapter 7 again, this time verses 5 to 7, it reads, If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place. 
in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. And so we can see here that the Lord has a merciful and loving heart. He still wants to give his people a chance, no, <coughs> excuse me, no matter what has happened. And so Jeremiah's prophetic word challenged people about theft and murder. It challenged them about adultery and perjury, burning incense to Baal and following other unknown gods. He talked of children gathering wood, fathers lighting fires and women kneading dough to make cakes of bread for the goddess, the queen of heaven, and how drink offerings were poured out to other gods. Despite this, the Lord knew that people would not listen to Jeremiah. He told them in Jeremiah 7, this time verse 29, Cut off your hair and throw it away. Take up a lament on the barren heights, for the Lord has rejected and abandoned this generation that is under his wrath. The Lord continued with more grim news for Jeremiah to tell the people. So we're going to go now to Jeremiah again, chapter 7, reading from verses 30 to 34. And Jeremiah told the people, The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in the house that bears my name and have defiled it. They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire. Something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. Which I always find extraordinary when the Lord says, nor did it enter his mind. He never fathomed that people could be so utterly evil. So it reads on. So beware. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. For they will bury the dead in Topheth, until there is no more room. Then the carcasses of the people will become food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and there will be no one to frighten them away. I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness and to the voices of bride and bridegroom in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for the land will become desolate. And finally, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, he says, At that time, declares the Lord, the bones of the kings and officials of Judah, the bones of the priests and the prophets and the bones of the people of Jerusalem will be removed from their graves. They will be exposed to the sun and the moon and all the stars of the heavens, which they have loved and served and which they have followed and consulted and worshipped. They will not be gathered up or buried, but will be like refuge lying on the ground. Wherever I banish them, all the survivors of this evil nation will prefer death to life, declares the Lord Almighty. And so once again, we get this horrific picture of so many people who are going to be murdered and tossed into this valley. So many that they can't all be buried. I can't help but think, you know, when you've been to Jerusalem and you go down the valley and you look down there, that this valley was this horrific place of <coughs> worship sacrifice people, prostitution, and, as we read here, ultimately death. Many, many bodies would die in this location, right next to the, the Temple of Jerusalem. So, at another time, also early in the reign of Jehoiakim, the prophet Jeremiah received another the word of the Lord, who told him in Jeremiah, now we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 26, if you want to go to that now. And we've got a few scriptures from Jeremiah 26. So the first one is Jeremiah 26, verse 2. And it reads, Stand in the courtyard, courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Again, the God of Israel was merciful and loved his people so he told Jeremiah to tell them in verses 4 to 6 of Jeremiah 26, If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, 
Then I will make this house like Shiloh and the sit- this city an object of cursing among the nations of the earth. Jeremiah's prophetic word of the Lord challenged the priests, other prophets and the people. But as soon as he finished, they seized him. And they said in verses 8 to 9 of Jeremiah 26, You must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh and this city will be desolate and deserted? The officials of Judah heard what was happening and went up from the royal palace to the temple and stood next to the entrance of the new gate. This is thought to be the upper gate that was built by King Jotham that we mentioned in a few lessons ago. And it led into the inner court. The priests and the prophets said to them and the people there in Jeremiah 26 verse 11, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. And so how extraordinary, a prophet of the Lord, they're threatening him to kill him because he's speaking the word of the Lord to them. And so instead of them listening, we find that they want to kill him instead because, like we have in today's world, He's not saying what they want to hear, so they don't want to hear it. And so their idea is, let's have him killed. So Jeremiah told them the Lord had sent him to speak his word and that they needed to reform their ways or the Lord will bring upon them the disaster he has pronounced. Unlike the priests and the prophets who wanted him dead, his officials and the people said in Jeremiah 26 verse 16, This man should not be sentenced to death. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So just as I was mentioning, that some people here are recognising that he spoke in the name of the Lord. Then some of the elders came forward and they said, now we're going to Jeremiah 26 again, verses 18 to 19 this time. Then some of the elders came forward and said, Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah. He told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Zion will be ploughed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. It's a scripture which we we did cover. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else in Judah put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favour? And did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring the disaster he pronounced against them? We are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. And so there's those amongst them who realise that if they don't change right here and now, that it's going to be too late. So there was another prophet called Uriah, son of Shammah, who came from kiriath Jerim, close to Jerusalem, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept for 20 years. So that was the place where King David brought it up after it had been delivered from Beth Shemesh. In Jeremiah 26 verse 20, it says that this prophet Uriah prophesied in the name of the Lord. He prophesied the same things against this city and this land as Jeremiah did. So we learn from this that there's more than one prophet speaking the same words. Proclaiming the message, though, only served to anger the king, so he sought to kill Uriah. Subsequently, fleeing to Egypt and terror, Jehoiakim sent Elnathan, the son of Achbor, with some other men to bring him back. They found him, and on his return, the king had him executed. Jeremiah, however, was spared the same fate because he was well connected. In Jeremiah 26, verse 24, it says, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, who was King Josiah's court secretary, supported Jeremiah and so he was not handed over to the people to be put to death. So we see here that one was put to death whereas the other's execution was stayed because of their connection. So this gives us all of the prophetic words that we were looking at coming from Jeremiah. You can imagine reading this portion of the Bible without the words of Jeremiah. It would be very, very shallow and dry reading and purely historical and so we realize that the onset of the babylonians is all about god and all about punishment for sin for his people so we're going to return to eliakim to a more uh, personal look at his story 
So Eliakim was not only shocked when his father King Josiah was killed by an Egyptian arrow, but was surprised and you can imagine infuriated when the people of Judah elected and anointed his young half-brother Shalom to be the next king of Judah. So you can imagine, he's got two brothers who are older than him, he's got one brother who's younger than him, and the youngest of all four of them got selected by the people. So although Eliakim was second in line to the throne, it should have been his elder brother Johanan who ascended the throne. Sorry, the second in line. Popular with the officials at court and the people of Judah, and this is the explanation for why, Shalom took the name Jehoahaz, which means God has held firmly or possession of the Lord. So this is Josiah. When he named his kids and we go through each of the names, you realise that they have really beautiful names that are representative of Josiah's faith in the Lord. And yet his kids didn't represent those things. Interestingly, when each of them were made king, their name was changed. And so perhaps this is a reason for the name change. But far from honouring his new name, the new king began to oppress and extort the very people who elected him. Innocent blood was shed and the new king focused on his own greatness by, build, by commencing to build the great palace. But this wasn't to last. So when Pharaoh Necho defeated his father's army and three months later arrived in Jerusalem, Eliakim's brother, the new king Jehoahaz, put up no resistance and the Pharaoh made it clear that the kingdom of Judah was now subject to Egypt. To impose his authority, he took Eliakim's brother the freely elected king of the people, and put him in chains. In 2 Kings 23, and so our last scriptures for tonight are from 2 Kings 23, verse 33 says, He then imposed on Judah a levy of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And so we can see through this that the practice was if you depose someone and you put somebody on, and you said, well, I'll put you on if you agree to do this, and so this is what he's actually done. Uh, it doesn't say much, as we mentioned earlier, about the relationship between the brothers of, uh, of uh, Josiah or Josiah's sons. So it's common to leave a garrison and a governor to rule over a conquered people, but it was more effective to have an autonomous ruler lead their own people as long as they paid tribute and supplied mercenary soldiers and labourers when needed. So we've mentioned this before. For this reason, Pharaoh Necho II placed his own puppet king on the throne of Judah, but once again, Johanan, the eldest son of King Josiah, was overlooked for another. In 2 Kings 23, verse 34 this time, it says, Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim son of Josiah king in place of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim. So Pharaoh Necho II gave the throne of Judah to Eliakim and gave him the title Jehoiakim which means raised by God or raised by Yahweh. Eliakim, now King Jehoiakim, watched his half-brother taken away in chains and knew what would happen if he didn't pay the tribute demanded by the Pharaoh. And so we get another picture of what happens. You take one away and the other obeys because he doesn't want the same. And so he stepped, instead of uh, fighting for his brother, he stepped into his shoes and, and took the lifestyle. So 2 Kings 23 verse 35 reads, Jehoiakim paid Pharaoh Necho the silver and gold he demanded. In order to do so, he taxed the land and exacted the silver and gold from the people of the land according to their assessments. So King Jehoiakim was no different to his half-brother, nor many of his forefathers before him, for he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so this is where we're going to stop uh, tonight on this lesson we're going to continue the other half of King Jehoiakim's story there's a lot of prophetic words in this part of the Bible and there's also a lot of historical things that are about to happen with the uh, Babylonian Empire coming and so we're going to um, follow the story of King Jehoiakim uh, from 609 BC uh, when we see these battles finish and we'll follow what happens through the balance of his life until he ends up being dragged out of the city by a donkey and dumped on the road at the entrance to the gates on there. So uh, I pray that you've uh, enjoyed this. Um, important always to understand that when we read the Bible, we mention this over and over, but when we read the Bible, if we just read one book at a time, 
we're going to miss so much. If you actually look at the content that comes from Kings tonight, it's very minuscule. It's actually very, very small. And yet the content that gives us all the details of what's really going on comes out of the prophet Jeremiah. So when we read the books of the prophets, we find not only do we hear from the Lord and what's happening and why it's happening, but we also learn a lot of detail which we don't get through the more, more historical books of the Bible. So just remember when you're reading the book of Kings or the book of Chronicles, there is prophets put beside the kings all the way through, and so it's important to read those books at the same time in order to get a full picture of what's going on at the time. So, uh, so before we uh, go, uh, if you would like to uh, watch this again, you can play this back on uh, Facebook, on the Jesus Movement 2000, that's where we're uh, broadcasting now. Uh, all of the videos are put up onto YouTube, so you can go to our YouTube channel, Paul Brunson and the Jesus Movement, and subscribe there. Or you can watch the videos on our website at thejesusmovement.com.au. So thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. And we look forward to your company next time.